Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you're watching this uh, Balleric Yacht Show uh, webinar and uh, virtual workshop, uh, part of a new virtual yacht experience here in uh, Mallorca. Unfortunately, I'm not there, but uh, my panel is here on screen with me, and I've got a very interesting group of people talking about uh, fiscal matters across the European landscape, specifically the Mediterranean. Uh, I've got members from Greece, Malta, Italy, France, and Spain, all very qualified, well-known faces in the market, and I'm very excited to have a, an interesting conversation with all five of them. So listen, I'm gonna kick off uh, going from east to west, um, basically looking at the uh, landscape in Greece, through Malta, into Italy, and then ending up fr via France into Spain. Probably a fairly typical cruising pattern in the summer. So I'm gonna welcome Jennifer Timonis from, uh, you're in Athens, aren't you, Jennifer? I'm in Athens. Uh, Jennifer, give me a latest update. Uh, what, what's happened in Greece in the last summer and what's going to happen and what your, let's say your current status quo is in the, uh, the Greek market. Okay, well, thanks very much, Martin. Um, the Balearic Yacht Show, the Super Yacht Group for organizing this session. It's fantastic to be included with all the other experts from other key European yachting hubs. Um, so before I tuck into where we are today, yachting-wise in Greece, I want to touch on the season which just passed. Obviously, it was a difficult season for all of the industry, including, of course, the local market. Um, in the lead up to summer 2020, we were blessed to have uh, achieved low record of COVID incidents and deaths in Greece, which clearly gave comfort to visitors wishing to come from abroad. Saying that the season delayed um, to kickstart as travel and cruising restrictions were lifted very slowly and clients were tentative to commit to travel plans. Our cruising, but mainstream of well, mainstream of activity took off late uh, July onwards, and what we saw was, and the reason I'm referring to it is, depending what kind of restrictions we have this summer, I expect it to be sort of a similar situation to some extent. Um, we saw boats which were home ported in Greece were busy cruising throughout the season once the restrictions were lifted, mainly private yachts or commercial yachts being used privately by their UBOs because that's possible under Greek regulations without a charter party in place. Um, it was good to see a number of clients using their boats um, privately who historically operate their boats uh, commercially. So they got to spend time on board because most of their charters were, were canceled or rescheduled for next summer. Charter licenses, sorry, charter vessels without Greek charter licenses could not start and end charters in Albania and Turkey because of border restrictions. So that was, um, that meant that there were far less charters taking place in Greece for, uh, for yachts without Greek charter licenses. So again, depending how we're going to be next summer coming in 21 with restrictions on Albania and Turkey, because otherwise the charter would have to start in Italy, which obviously means it's not convenient because charterers have to be on board from the place of embarkment. Um, also, the border restrictions affected duty-free bunkering for yachts cruise, for private yachts cruising in Greek waters who like to pop over to Sarande in Albania or Turkey to fuel duty-free. We didn't have that. Um, finally, of course, the fact that we had travel restrictions on non-EU visitors had a huge impact on the charters taking place because it hit uh, big groups, Russian clients, Americans, and Middle East. Uh, so we expect to face some of these, uh, well, most of these hurdles this season, depending how widespread the pandemic is. But we're positive that it'll be a much smoother and productive summer in the East Med, as we all know the drill now, hygiene procedures, crew training, amendments to charter agreement. We've done it. We know what to expect and we're much more, we're ready for it this time. Moreover, already a number of the charters from last year have been rescheduled for 2021, which is uh, encouraging. So that's already a good starting boost to the season uh, amongst uh, other. I think people are more willing to travel now that they know sort of what to expect. Last year, it was still very difficult and the, the UK was still in June pretty messy COVID wise. So we also lost a lot of clients from the UK, London based. Um, for the time being, the main issue which remains to be tackled is how the new laws introduced earlier this year in Greece relating to VAT on charge fees will be implemented because, I mean, they've more or less managed to get in line with the European directive, but we didn't really get a chance to test it this um, summer because they introduced a COVID alleviating um, law which automatically sets the uh, VAT rate at 13% on charters just to help the market. Uh, also, the way they're going to balance it, it works on a 60% of um, time spent 
beyond six nautical miles outside of Greek territorial waters from the mainland or the island where you set off your, on your, where you embarked the commencement of charter. So they want you to record it on the uh, AIS and also they're going to, the government's going to set up an app which lines up with the AIS and records such movements, but neither the AIS yet hasn't been implemented because people didn't have to rely on it yet because the government hasn't, they've got until March 2021 to get the app in, in place. So that, that's the big change for this summer. And it will affect mainly um, boats with Greek charter licenses because they'll be targeting for the 50% on the 24% VAT rate. Uh, other boats starting and ending outside of Greece charters will only be liable to uh, pay VAT for the time spent in Greek waters. But again, there's also no system to collect VAT uh, on such charters. So yeah, it remains to be seen that that's the big issue for this summer coming. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you, Jennifer. I think, I think what, what is interesting there is, as you say, there's always these mechanisms put in place, but it's the collection that's the key thing. And that's probably a conversation we have um, later on as a panel. Uh, I think the other question I have for you is from a Greek perspective, being there this summer, uh, just gone, is how are the local um, support networks and the infrastructure, have they, let's say, how they survived this last summer in terms of being ready for next year? I think, uh, like I said, the fact that so many charters have been rescheduled for next year already has given people sort of a safety and um, security blanket. Uh, we did what we could do. It was, very, it was extremely difficult summer in the sense that clients were calling, they wanted to come, they wanted to charter, but there were so many restrictions. This time round, I think everyone will be more organized, even the authorities, the state, the professionals on the ground, to be able to tackle such questions. We were a little bit in the dark at times and waiting for restrictions to be lifted. I mean, we had a lot of boats stranded in Turkey. That was quite a stressful trying to get them home. Yes. Yeah, but various issues. So I, I, I think that they, they fared well, but they'll definitely, all of us will fare better now this summer coming. Yeah. Uh, we weren't ready for, I mean, no, no. Everyone did their best, but it was it was very grey. Yeah, and All it right. was thank pan-European that. So yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Right, let's move across the uh, the water to Malta. Uh, and Alison, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Always, always okay. So listen, what's the what's the state of play in Malta from this year, and what what your concerns or let's say issues you need to address for 2021? Okay, so well, I mean, just to give a very quick roundup, also following um, what Jennifer was explaining, obviously with Malta, it's a bit of a different um, scenario in that the bulk of arrivals of yachts is related not so much to chartering, of which there is, of course, but mainly it's regards deliveries, importations, and all the structuring we do here. And obviously, as from March, when the ports and airports were closed for a number of months, except for essential services, um, that brought everything to a halt um, and, and that meant that what are usually the busiest months as regards arrival of yachts um, was, was stalled. So we obviously engaged with the authorities. Um, the advantage of course is that yachting is a very contained risk, you know, it's, it's a number of, of crew, it's a number of yachts that could come. And we did manage to, um, uh, to service a number of clients. However, undoubtedly, there was a slowdown um, in, in the season, um, which was then delayed, as Jennifer said as well. And now we have seen a very unusual, busy um, time towards the end of summer and coming into October and November. So, which is of course great. Um, I think looking to uh, to next season, I'm I'm quite positive, um, and I say it first of all because I'm obsessively reading scientific journals, and, and I, I'm, I'm trying to you know um, uh, there's there's this sort of science is giving us quite a, um, a, some comfort as regards the the probabilities of having a vaccine very soon. Um, and I'm also positive because from speaking to, to my counterparts in, in London, of course, as you know, we work very closely with the London transactional market. Um, it seems to be buoyant. There's a lot of activity happening. Um, yachts are being purchased, yachts are being sold. 
Uh, Malta, of course, comes at the tail end in the sense that once the transactional market in the UK is and Monaco, of course, um, is, is busy, then we see a ripple effect and yachts then coming to Malta for all the various services we, we offer. So the indications I'm getting so far is that we can look ahead um, uh, and, and expect that it will be a busy commencement of, of the year. I would say perhaps it will even be anticipated um, to catch up with all the, all the transactional work that's going on. So at the risk of sounding you know, um, too, too positive, um, however, I think that there's no reason why we shouldn't be preparing for a busy time. And, and I think Martin will be talking later about it. It's even more important to, to guide buyers and guide clients um, at this very point in time. Yeah. Um, what's been happening in Malta um, from the legal side, we have seen a much smoother importation process, which is now reaping benefits, in that we've removed the requirement of a bank guarantee for importations of yachts coming to Europe for charter requirements when the owning company is Maltese. So that's, uh, of course, a, a big plus to owners. Um, and there has been a reduction in the bank guarantee that's required if the owning company is not multi. So even there, there is there's an advantage. And of course, um, uh, leaving the best for last, um, just a few weeks ago, we've, we've had the news that um, the commission has withdrawn its action against Malta. The pity is that we can't all have a big celebratory party, of course, but uh, we'll, we'll postpone it. Um, but uh, joking aside, I think this comes as an indication of a new landscape as regards VAT on charters and VAT on leases. And again, I know that we'll be perhaps looking into this in, in some more detail. But definitely, um, we're seeing that uh, with the tools we have in hand, and uh, fingers crossed of a busier season next year, um, we're very well placed to, to uh, offer clients some very good product and some very good services. Awesome. Thank you very much indeed. Very interesting. Um, yes, the, the, the EU decision was very, very timely, I think. Yes, I mean, obviously, we've seen Malta change the, the guidelines related to VAT on leases in January of this year, Martin. Um, and we've seen how that Italy and France these past weeks have made some, some very strong announcements. Of course, I'll leave my, my colleagues who are much better versed to, to give you the detail on that. Um, but essentially, we're seeing that there is a level playing field um, being uh, delineated now. Yeah. Um, there is a harmonization. I mean, this is the buzzword that we always like to throw around, but I think this time we can use it because uh, now we're seeing that the principle is that VAT will be applied, that the rates that are applicable in the member states concerned, so in what that would be 18%. But if owners can prove that the yacht has spent time outside of the EU, then there is a method of apportionment regarding the time spent outside. Yeah. And I think that's a very fair way of looking at it because after all, VAT is a consumption tax, right? So you pay VAT on, on, on the enjoyment, on the services that you are obtaining. Um, leasing structures are, are have a place in the auto market, like they have a place in the aviation industry, they have a, a place in the luxury car asset industry. I see absolutely no reason why yachts should be discriminated in that respect. Yeah. Um, and I think that with now Italy and France following Malta's um, uh, delineation of the rules with regard to time spent, uh, I think we're looking at uh, greater certainty for the market. Um, with the Commission closing the proceedings, I think we can safely shut the door on, on a very long saga. And uh, I think that it's very good news for owners. Yeah, yeah agreed, agreed. And practitioners, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I think that's the, that's the key thing. I think there's a lot of what we'll call misinformation or misunderstanding out there. And I think this is part of the whole process is to try and clarify and qualify what's really happening. And also give, as, as we said earlier on, just really good sound advice. So that's, that's part of the process we have to look at. So I'm, I'm gonna move across from Malta slightly north and uh, into the Italian waters. And we have now a cat on the screen, which is even better, wonderful. <laughs> uh, live cat action. So, so Sarah, sorry, can I give you a, a little introduction. How is things in uh, your wonderful part of the world, Italy, and what's the landscape, what's the future, and what do you all think, thoughts on the, uh, the tax world? 
Good morning, everybody. Ah, in our wonderful state, uh, we are not in lockdown, and this is a good news. <laughs> no, it was an art summer, sure, yeah. as everybody, but uh, I agree uh, with Jennifer and Alison. Thanks to my role in the company, I was able to touch the market, and I can confirm that there was an increase uh, at the end of the season of the charter activity, even if, of course, will never be the same uh, of the past years. Um, I can also say that I'm very optimistic for the coming season 2021. Uh, we already start receiving charter contracts, not only those uh, that have been rescheduled last year, but also brand new contracts. Yes. And this is Thanks also to the uh, grant that has been given by the tax authority until October 31st to continue to benefit of the old VAT scheme of the VAT reduction, uh, the famous 6.6. Uh, everybody loves 6.6, uh, .6, but unfortunately died <laughs> from November 1st. So, um, the situation uh, uh, in general in the country is, uh, of course, risky, but uh, we are confident uh, that in the next months things will be much better. Um, as I said, we are not in lockdown, so the activities uh, um, all over the, the country uh, are in force and that's the reason why we have seen in the past months and we will see in the coming months that yachts will continue to be delivered so i'm based in viareggio uh, just behind the most famous uh, shipyard uh, in the world and i can confirm that the activity is a lot despite the virus so um, I agree with Alison that is this harmonization of the VAT law will be a positive one because also for the market, especially for non-EU market, we will be uh, seen finally as a community. And this is a good goal. So we will have to work a lot, uh, still a lot uh, to, to harmonize, to work all together, uh, all the countries with the community. But uh, I'm very optimistic. And that's the reason why what we have to do as operators uh, of the charter market to put the, the the captains, uh, the, the, the charter market in general, in a position to face uh, the coming season in a simply way, what we have to do now is to, prepare, to be prepared, to be simple, to create tools, uh, to let them uh, face uh, the new VAT law that will be the same uh, in Italy, in France, uh, as better as much better as possible uh, personally um, i'm facing uh, day by day uh, with the captains and charter managers and i perfectly understand what they need they need simple instruction simple tools to make their lives simpler um, so we will do our best. Uh, thanks uh, to the latest uh, provision issued by the tax authority on October 29, finally, we received uh, a clear picture of what are the proofs uh, tax authority needs to apply correctly uh, the new VAT law. And uh, starting from this fi uh, final clarification, we have to start working. Um, my 
uh, feeling uh, uh, is uh, that the market uh, is already prepared because uh, as you know Italy had a strange story during 2020. Um, low, the low entry imports and then was stopped and then changed. Uh, some clarification came in force. Uh, so it was very confusing and in the meantime uh, the few uh, yachts was able to do charters in the first month uh, were able to start understanding how it works. So I'm very optimistic. Maybe I'm stupid, but <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that at all, Sarah. I think that, not at all. I think, I think it's, good, it's good to make sure this panel and these people on the, on the screen talking about tax once have what I call a positive message and also a clarification because I think that's always been a, a sort of from my point of view a, a topic that needs bringing forward is that, that this is a positive year for change and we're going to end up with a better landscape in 21 and beyond so it's good to put a positive spin on everything especially with the year we're just going through so that's a, that's a good message thank you very much Sarah right guys it's your turn now France how's France always the interesting tax jurisdiction Freddie, how are you? Yes, <clears throat> fine. Uh, good, and you, Martin. Well, so right. thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, we are, I'm glad to, uh, to take part in this, in this event, of course. So uh, the landscape in France, especially for tax uh, aspects, is always a hot topic for us, and you know that. Um, but before, before um, speaking about the, the recent changes, I would like to um, to review the, uh, the season and what we have seen. I think we have experienced the same situation as for my colleagues. So less imports of yachts, commercially operated, and of course, uh, the impact of, of the restrictions of movement. Uh, movement of yachts, a movement of crew, a movement of travelers. So it's clear that when you have this type of concept, you have a direct impact on the activity and the commercial activity for, for yachts, uh, commercially operated. So we, uh, we had the, the same kind of consequence. Uh, a lot of charters were rescheduled uh, for next year. And uh, so it means that the, the impact was uh, on the commercial activity. And we know in France that this impact um, could um, have consequence in order to benefit, for example, for VAT exemption. And because we have this uh, French commercial exemption with the calculation of the 70 personal um, so the, the navigation on IC. So if you have less contract, automatically uh, the, uh, this criterion is impacted. So it is the type of situation that we have now. Uh, so I think it's difficult to, to be, I'm not um, pessimistic for this, uh, for, for this season because it was a fact. And as, uh, as often, uh, the market is able to change, to modify the behaviors, and will be able to, uh, uh, to adapt his own practices uh, to, be, uh, um, to be positive for the future. Uh, so uh, I'm not really pessimistic with this situation because all the, uh, all the companies and, and all the, um, the person involved in the business were impacted by the... Uh, uh, by the sanitary crisis. So what we have to do first for, for the clients, for the owners, and for the, um, for the charters is just to well prepare uh, the next season and to consider the experience uh, we have with this situation. Uh, so what we, uh, we know in France is that the, uh, the tax authorities have used this particular period uh, to modify uh, the tax legislation. And uh, so um, uh, I suppose that you have heard the recent change on the uh, on the seventy uh, the fifty percent reduction applicable on charters starting from France, um, France was known in the past um, for uh, their the particular uh, VAT treatment on charters. So it was possible to benefit automatically uh, from this uh, lump sum reduction without demonstrating a navigation outside the EU territorial waters. This is the end of the scheme, and this is normal. Uh, because the EU Commission has explained, and this is the same situation in Italy, that if you want to benefit from a reduction, you have to evidence that you have used 
the vessel outside the EU territorial waters. So in the past, because we wanted to simplify the process, it was admitted, admitted to benefit from this uh, automatic reduction. Um, from the first of number, uh, it would be not possible um, for the future. So it means that for the next year um, and for the contract that will be signed uh, under the new uh, legal framework, uh, you have the choice between two options. First, you are not able to evidence this use outside the EU territorial waters. You apply the normal weight of VAT for charters starting from France, 20% of VAT. If you want to benefit from a reduction, you have to be ready uh, to provide all the evidence of this use outside the EU territorial waters. So this is, um, this is in line with the EU VAT regulation. This is in line with the, uh, with the common practice uh, everywhere. And because in France, we use the, uh, what we call the use and engagement of option. So if you want to benefit from this uh, reduction, uh, you have to demonstrate uh, the portion of time that you have spent outside the EU territorial which impact for the owners, of course, the, um, the need uh, to evidence this use, uh, the question of the method to be applied. Uh, so for the time being, we have the principle of this change, but we are um, trying to obtain clarification from the, uh, from the tax and the customs authorities on that side. And this is not really difficult, easy, uh, just because of we are still in, in the lockdown. And so I think my main concern is now to uh, and uh, to have feedback uh, from the authorities to clarify this, uh, just because um, we know that we have this change of law of the doctrine, but we have nothing very clear in terms of, um, of method to be applied um, on, which, on which criteria um, do we calculate uh, the time spent outside the EU, um, a day by day, hour by hour, uh, there is nothing clear in, the, uh, in this doctrine. So I think that for next year, and we have time to clarify that. I think it is very important to have this, um, uh, this clarification on the doctrine so that all the clients, the owners, can have a clear picture of the situation and how to proceed. Um, we, we know that clients want to have um, a clear situation before um, signing contract or before moving to uh, one country. Uh, so it is really important when you decide to change the rule uh, to be able to explain the impact of this rule. So we know that the impact is the, the rate of that to be, to be applied on the contract. But I think it is very important to be able to, to give the, uh, the keys uh, for, the, uh, for the managers, for the, uh, for the captain as well, because we know that it is not really a problem for the charter. It is a problem for the owner and the captain, because the captain will be on board and we have to determine when the clock uh, will be on uh, to calculate this time outside the EU territorial water. So as, as often we have practical points to clarify with the authorities. So um, if we could start these discussions as soon as possible, I think it would be good for the markets and it will be good for next year. So it is the point, we, but we have all um, various questions that we have raised before the authorities, for example, the impact of this sanitary crisis I've explained that um, for the calculation of the 70% rule, it is not really easy for the, uh, for the yacht owners because some of them have decided to uh, not to operate commercially their boat uh, this season. So with no charter, you have not respected the 70% uh, the rules, but we can, we can think that this year is not a common year, common year it's not a usual year. So, uh, we, we should be able to convince the authorities to consider this specific impact um, in order to modify their view, their interpretation, uh, so that um, owners and yachts uh, cannot be um, placed in, in difficulties with this, uh, uh, this sanitary crisis. So <clears throat> we try to obtain clarification from them. Uh, it's a little bit long because it is friends and will like administrative discussions, you know, and uh, so uh, we hope to have this clarification before the, uh, uh, the next season, and we will do our best to, um, uh, to have this clarification. It is, it is clear, but uh, I think I'm, I'm positive because there is no reason to think that we are not able to, to change our uh, practices and to, be, um, uh, to respect uh, the rules. But it is clear that this 
Um, um, it, it requires from the authorities to be very open uh, to the question raised by the, uh, by the owners and the, uh, the yachting professional and, and the association as well, because they know their market, they know the practices and they need answers, clear answers uh, before the, uh, the next year. Yeah. It is the situation and the landscape in France, Martin. Freddie, thanks a million for that. Very, very, very good. Uh, we'll come back to that topic as well in the whole um, charter world in about 10 minutes. But before that, uh, we're in the Balearic Yacht Show virtual. So let's go to Spain and talk to Miguel. Miguel, how are you? Very well, thank you, Martin. How are you? I'm all right, I'm all right, still okay. And I'm looking forward to hearing what the, la the landscape is in the Balearics, because obviously that's another interesting part of the marketplace and had a different season this year. So give me your perspective, please, Miguel. Yes, well, uh, regarding the, the Balearics, uh, the, the 2020 season has been a short and a quite strange season due to the pandemic and the health problems, lockdowns, difficulties for people to travel, crew, etc. Everybody knows it has been a little bit better, a little bit worse in different countries, but it has been a special but not very good season. But uh, to be honest, uh, we are very optimistic uh, in front of the, the next season for 2021 because uh, we have seen, as uh, Alison has said before, and Freddie also, that many charters have, be, have been rescheduled for 2021 and are still in place, obviously will depend on the restrictions uh, that uh, could appear in, in the next season and the uh, possibilities to perform the charters if there is a uh, fourth major um, items that could uh, avoid the charters to take place. But in this sense, uh, what we see is a lot of activity, uh, not only in the charter market, but also as Alison has already commented in the, in the sales of yachts, marketing, uh, we see it from the, from the London perspective, from the US market perspective, there are slots for 2023, 24, 25 in the shipyard. So there are many people uh, that perceives uh, the yachting also uh, as an opportunity due to the pandemic. It is perceived as a safe holidays with privacy, with attractive lifestyle, Etc. and the market is moving. So uh, we are quite optimistic uh, um, for next season. Although we perfectly know that uh, there are some aspects that escape to the will of the owners or the charters or, or whatever else. We, we, we also think that uh, uh, owners and, 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 and also uh, brokers and MIBA is sensible to that uh, will probably need to be more flexible in the possibilities to uh, cancel, to exchange one charter for one day to another day to reschedule, etc. And MIBA has, uh, in fact, uh, issued uh, an annex to the to the to the charter contract uh, on COVID aspects, uh, even including the possibility of the cancellation of the broker commission, which is something very welcome uh, coming from MIBA. Uh, it, it is something to, to appreciate, I think. Uh, this kind of flexibility did not exist before, but this is somehow like Amazon. If it's difficult uh, to uh, um, refund the money or to uh, change the product because it's not in good state, you will not sell the product. If we are flexible, we give certainty, security to the client, they, they will be more in disposal uh, to contract. If uh, things go bad, they are refunded, refunded the, the money or uh, give an alternative. So I, I think this is something we have to work with. And regarding uh, the, the Spanish landscape, uh, well, it has been demonstrated at the end of the day that regarding charter on VAT, the Spanish government sadly was right uh, and, and charged uh, a full rate on VAT. Uh, um, 
the, 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 the lump sum reductions and forfeit reduction has disappeared. We expect that now, and I think that the Spanish government is in disposal, we will take the same position then, Malta, Italy, France, so that uh, the charter can be taxed only uh, when sailing within the customs territory and be exempt when they are out on the basis of the VAT directive. Uh, there is also a couple of uh, good news uh, from a Spanish perspective is that um, until the date only non-EU yachts could be chartered in the Balearics and Barcelona. There is a new instruction from the General Directorate of Merchant Marine of July uh, 2020, this year, so a couple of months ago, that allows all non-EU charters to charters uh, everywhere in Spain, uh, provided that they have 14 meters at least. So this is a very good news because it comes uh, to the same uh, situation that exists in France or in Italy or wherever. We, we, we were a little back on, on, on these issues and now uh, will be perfectly feasible. And we saw that also the tax authorities are in disposal to take measures because we have uh, accomplished recently working together with the port authorities of Melilla. You may know that Ceuta and Melilla are two cities, two Spanish cities in the north of Africa, bordering Morocco. Uh, Ceuta, for example, is 15 miles from Gibraltar and Melilla is 80 miles or 90 miles from the Spanish mainland, so that uh, we have uh, canceled the use and enjoyment rule for VAT purposes if the yachts uh, charter beginning from Ceuta and Melilla. This is very interesting because if uh, owners or charters, we have to hear at them if they want to do that, if it's their idea, if it fits with the plans of the owner of, or the yacht, but could sail uh, the south of Spain, the Balearics, uh, the Mediterranean the Spanish coast by paying only 0.1% on the charter fees, which is the local tax in force, uh, not now, but in short, in Ceuta and Melilla. Now is 4%, which is not too bad, but will be 0.1%. I assume that if people were in disposal to, to charter from Port Vendres to Palma, uh, taking some uh, 300 miles to avoid 10%, maybe to avoid 21%, they are in disposal to, uh, to sail uh, 80 or 90 miles more to reach Palma. So this is a good news. Interesting. Okay, so listen, Miguel, thank you very much for your comments on, on Spain. Let's have a bit of a discussion. Uh, obviously, this is going to be interesting on, on a virtual conference. I'm going to try and make sure it becomes dynamic and interesting. I'm going to throw a little curveball at you because you're all from the European territories. Uh, let's talk about the, 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 the new thing that's on the horizon, which may affect our market, and I'll be interested in your perspectives. I'm here in the UK and the UK is leaving or has left or is about to leave the EU. A lot of British people, a lot of UK flags. What do you think Brexit is gonna to do to the Mediterranean or the European landscape from your uh, personal perspective? What do you think is gonna be the impact of Brexit? Let's talk about that for about five or 10 minutes. Who would like to go first? Well, I, I can, I can. Uh, <laughs> few comments um, because obviously we have we have quite a large number of, of UK residents who because of the relationship between Malta and the UK it's a jurisdiction that seems to, to that, that UK residents are comfortable with. Um, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what will happen um, with regard to yachts that have um, been imported or have been um, accounted for in the UK with regard to their, their VAT status. And I recently followed a, a forum um, where, of course, it, I mean, I'm not a UK lawyer, so there were competent people who were commenting about it. 
And uh, they were very upfront in saying that there were mixed messages being given by the authorities at different times as regards the VAT status of yachts that will be found in Europe at any particular time. And I, I received a very clear feeling that it is something that still needs to be clarified. Um, from uh, to reply to what you said as to what I envisage the manner in which I envisage it will impact owners, especially UK owners, is that obviously um, uh, owners who want to use their yachts privately will be able to benefit from temporary uh, admission in Europe. So effectively, that means that they would be able to import their yacht um, in the UK. Um, and they would be able to benefit from, uh, from temporary admission for 18 months, um, whereby no VAT would need to be paid on the yacht. So definitely that is something which is at the forefront of our clients' minds, um, current clients and inquiries we are getting, and it is a very valid uh, point. So, so people are already thinking about that as an option going forward because it simplifies matters, obviously. Yeah. So I think that that will be um, an attraction for UK residents, which they will be availing themselves of. So that will change the landscape in, in that respect. Freddie, any comment? I have comment because you know, Martin, France is close to UK. <laughs> so we are prepared for the, uh, for, for the Brexit and the end of the, of the transitional period. Especially, you know, for the um, uh, for the anchor and over, but for the goods, um, I, I share the um, uh, Alison's point of view regarding the impact for the owners. But I think we we do not forget the impact for suppliers and shipyards as well, yeah. because um, the main the main consequence is that the UK territory will be considered as a third country, so um, it will impact yachts movement customs uh, status and tax uh, status of the yacht. But for the suppliers and the, um, and the shipyards, if you are uh, UK suppliers and you want to ship goods from UK to the, um, uh, to the EU or to France because the yacht is lying in, in Antibes or in Nice, and you have to know that it is not possible to, uh, to ship fully at the goods. You will have to organize your uh, customs formalities because the UK will be outside the EU territory. So um, it is the hand of the free movements of goods between the UK and the EU territory. So it is really important for suppliers, depending on the, uh, the place where the, um, uh, the yacht is located and where the, uh, the supplier is based as well. For the shipyard, is, the impact is, not, um, uh, is important as well. UK shipyards, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the sale for export, uh, France will be regarded as a, a third country, and so it will be possible to uh, to leave the UK territory and to stop in France and not in Jersey or Guernsey as they uh, they were used to do in the past. Um, for the shipyard as well, if you have um, vessels coming from the UK under the temporary mission regime, if they are eligible, uh, the vessel could be um, subject to repairs under the inward processing relief in France or in Spain or in Malta or in Italy. So it, it will open um, options uh, for, the, uh, for the yacht owners, for the suppliers, for the shipyard, but they have to be prepared uh, to the change and not to discover the change after the, the 1st of January. So I think it is very important. And I, um, I think as well that the, the impact will be not the same for private vessels and for commercial vessels, because we know that um, most of the, uh, of the yachts uh, that are commercially operated in the, uh, in the EU uh, will be based uh, in the EU or located in the EU before uh, the end of this year so that they can protect uh, their VAT status and so that they can be in free circulation after the, uh, um, the beginning of New Year. So I think it is the type of situation that we could have. I think if you have a question or you are not sure about the, uh, what you have to do with your yacht, it is very important to clarify the, the location because the situation will be not the same for yachts located in the UK, located in the EU, or located outside the UK or the EU. So uh, you have to, uh, to know what you want to do for next year and to consider the impact of this change of rules um, for the, um, uh, in light of your plans for your vessel. So if you want to use privately, temporary mission regime could be an option um, for the, uh, the commercially operated. You know that 
potentially you will have to handle customs formalities for your yacht. So um, be careful and consider the impact of this change. Yeah. Anybody coming from Italy, Greece, or Spain? Uh, yes, uh, Martin. Um, from Spain, I, I, I fully agree with the comments of Freddie. Brexit is uh, every time is more clear that we will have uh, most likely a hard Brexit. So uh, the uncertainty is, is, is increasing every time until the, the end of December. Uh, it is also true that Brexit will provide opportunities, as Freddie has commented, uh, the temporary admission regime uh, could be used, uh, provided that uh, requirements are met by the yacht owners. Uh, Inward process relief will, will be able to be used by, by, uh, by the European shipyard so that refits can be done, uh, VAT exempt, etc. And I think that the key issue is that we must be able to provide guidance and clarity to owners depending on their intention uh, to use the yacht in the UK, in Europe, uh, to charter the yacht, to use it privately, commercially, etc. This is uh, absolutely relevant and absolutely important, as well as to where the yacht is located at the time of Brexit. Uh, at midnight, the 31st of December, 2020. We have to give a very clear advice and the tax authorities and the customs authorities, because we cannot forget that Brexit is not uh, uh, exiting the EU, is exiting the EU, is exiting the customs territory and is exiting the VAT territory too. Uh, so uh, we have to bear this in mind and owners have to be also involved and family offices must be also involved to be aware of the changes in due time. Yeah. Sarah. Uh, Martin, uh, I totally agree with the uh, Spanish and French position, of course. Uh, uh, since situation in Italy, nothing is already in place because we are monitoring uh, uh, the negotiation between uh, UK and the Union Commission. Therefore, at the time being, the Italian custom authorities issued just general rules for goods, not for yacht. So mm, the main point uh, at the time being, uh, what is uh, mostly required by the market is uh, what will happen to UK flag yachts uh, VAT paid. And our position uh, at the time being is the same as uh, uh, Miguel said, uh, to, to suggest to the owners to uh, let be the yacht in the union territory uh, by the end of the year, by December 31st. Unfortunately, at the time being, nothing else can, can be said. <laughs> We will see what will happen. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, Please, just, a, just a couple of points. Um, temporary admission doesn't work um, completely the same here. So you can get an 18 month transit log, which uh, you during that period you use the boat for six months and then you need to file the transit log for six months and then you can use it again. But that means that a boat could essentially be in Greece for three, three years using her six months annually filing with the port authorities for six months and keeping that transit log for uh, three years, or even for 18 years, using the boat only for a month each year, which means that that will be quite attractive for home porting purposes for boats wanting to come in who, aren't, um, who want to come in under temporary admission right. in Greece. And another issue they'll face is that currently in order to obtain, if you want to obtain a Greek charter license, if you're non-EU, you're subject to income tax on the uh, charter income derived in Greece. So now all UK commercial vessels with uh, Greek commercial licenses will be hit by this income tax. So that's an interesting point. Yeah, thank you for that, Jennifer. Listen, I just have a, a hypothetical question I wanted to just throw out there on this Brexit topic. Do you think the customs offices and the, the officers themselves across the territory are aware or planning for the arrival of the Red Ensign with a British flag on it. So, and just so, how informed are they or how do you think they may react when they start seeing British flags post the, uh, the deadline? Uh, 
I'm just I'm out of interest. Do you think they're they're seeing it as an opportunity or they're seeing it, they'll just treat it as normal? I'm thinking about inspections and boarding and and being difficult potentially for yachts that are migrating with a with a red ensign or a, or a British flag on board. Yeah, Martin, Mark. if, if, if I'm allowed, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I, I think that um, um, as far as we are getting closer to December 2020, uh, the surveillance services of the uh, different custom offices will be more active with, uh, with, with UK flags. Uh, to check, to uh, investigate, to see the current status, etc. But uh, again, uh, we, we, we need to be able to provide the, the proper advice and involve owners in due time, because at the end of the day, there is a lot of confusion also with flags. It is clear that to apply uh, for temporary admission, one of the conditions is uh, to, to, to have a, a third country flag. Well, this will happen the 1st of January 2021, but not still now when the, the, the EU legislation is still applicable. After 1st of January of 2021, uh, we have to also bear in mind that the EU status of the yacht is not determined by the flag is determined by the fact of being imported or being produced in the EU or being paid VAT or accounted for because it's a commercial yacht. So we'll see because there have been many discussions about the keeping the EU status or not. Uh, but I think that the most logical is that if this EU status was acquired when the United Kingdom was part of the customs territory and the VAT territory, if the yacht remains in the EU, this should continue to apply. Because if not, you are creating a big uncertainty in the market. And we must be aware of that, not next month, now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in France, we um, we started discussions with the uh, with the tax and customs about the impact of the Brexit because we know that there is uh, there is a topic, and and we need uh, we need clarification from them because we um, um, we have specific approach. We we could have um, a clear view about the impact of this Brexit based on on our general knowledge of, of VAT and customs rules. But what, what we need to provide to, um, to clients is the, the confirmation that our view is correct. Uh, for the time being, uh, as you, you said, I think there is no feedback from the customs offices on, on that specific point because we have the COVID. <laughs> so they don't want to board yachts um, because it's not possible or it's a little bit complicated. I think uh, the issue will be for next year. Um, if, if you did not prepare um, uh, your, your file, uh, before the end of this year. Uh, so documentation regarding your VAT status, uh, as Miguel said, um, confirmation that the, the formalities were done, the customs formalities were done in line with the EU regulation, uh, confirmation of the import declaration, or uh, confirmation that your yacht was in free circulation uh, because produced in the, in the EU. It is a question about the EU customs status. So I don't want to be too technical, but uh, it's clear that uh, at this stage, um, I think it is not the main topic for the customs. Uh, the question about the, uh, you know, the custom status of yachts and the uh, confirmation of, of the of the VAT status uh, for for the next year, but it's not because it is the main concern for them that we uh, uh, we don't have to uh, to be ready and to prepare the uh, the topic for the clients and to ask questions so that we can confirm that if your your port was in first circulation uh, before the end of of this year, on the 1st of January, the situation will be the same. I think it is the uh, one of, of the main points because uh, some owners decided to, uh, uh, to leave their yachts in the EU because uh, they have their reasoning in mind. So we, uh, we, uh, we would, would like to have this, this official confirmation so that we can be able to provide this ruling and to avoid any risk for the future. It is what I, I recommend first with this Brexit. And the, um, um, even if we have good relationship with the uh, with the customs, 
and we appreciate their controls. Uh, I don't want to start any discussions with a, with a possible audit on the, uh, on the tax and custom situation of one of, of, of the owners or clients. Uh, I would like to be able to, to say that it is our point of view. Uh, it is confirmed from the, uh, the discussions we, uh, we had with the authorities and now you are safe for the future. But there, is, there will be other as, aspects in the future that we, we don't know if, if an agreement will be signed. It is still possible. Uh, so we, we have to be uh, ready to, um, to change our point of view if we have any, uh, any changes regarding the uh, potential agreement or if uh, there is a question about the, uh, the impact of the, uh, of the tax status. One point is, for, for example, if you have paid VAT on your boat in the UK, but you are in the EU, at the date of uh, the end of the transitional period, what will be the uh, the situation of the board? Because we know that the uh, the HMSC um, think about the uh, the fact of considering the, the tax situation of boats in the UK, but with the uh, the evidence of a VAT payment in the EU. So, is the the payment of the VAT in the EU will be considered in the UK after the end of the transitional period? It is a type of question that we can ask, and we should clarify this if you are in this situation. So it is really important to prepare uh, the, um, the Brexit in advance and to prepare the end of this transitional period, I think. So we're busy seven weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the uh, difficult to, uh, to have feedback from the authorities because they have a lot of to do. Yeah. And the, um, I'm, I'm not sure that the, uh, the, the Brexit is at the top of the priorities for French government at this stage. <laughs> of course, of course not. Jennifer, anything else you wanted to add to that topic or should we move on to the next topic? No, I covered. Okay, by cool. Freddie, Thank you. Freddie covered it. Thank you very much. Listen, I think the, the other subject, as we've all said in the various comments we've made, is that the, the charter, sec charter season in 2020 was decimated to, cert to a certain extent. A lot of cancellations, a lot of postponements, a lot of movements into 2021. Um, what's also interesting is we're hearing from the charter industry that there's a lot of interest in bookings for next year. Uh, so we may have what I call a, a super year uh, in terms of the highest number of charters for a long, long time in one single season. Um, what impact is that going to have, do you think, on sort of your, your positions and your work and your activities? Because it could be a very busy, busy year for everyone. And I, I think the whole thing of VAT on charter and the whole topic of how people are prepared for next year is going to be critical. So we need to give people what they call some, let's say, real hard-nosed advice as to how to manage next year, because it could be an interesting season. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I always seem to volunteer first, but not. <laughs> But um, I think that if you allow me to, I'll, I'll just go, not just, not just focusing on charters, but also on the actual sale and purchase market. Because I, as I said from the beginning, I really am getting very strong indications that it's a very busy um, time for, for that. And it's been confirmed also by Miguel, US market, and, and also the, the European build market. Um, and also secondhand yachts. Uh, there's been a, a lot of activity there with sale and purchase. So I think that, um, as I always say, going back to basics, it's, also, it's always seeking the right advice as soon as possible. I, I, I know it sounds as though it's completely biased, <laughs> but it, it's the truth. So it's important that the message is seek the correct advice as soon as you've identified a yacht, whether it's for charter, whether it's for, of course, to a lot, much larger extent, purchasing. Um, it does save a lot of um, worry and it does save a lot of time and it does save a lot of expense down the line because it's more expensive to remedy the mistakes or try and cut corners than it's having a clear structure, a robust structure from the beginning. And then I think there has to be a discussion on, on the intentions, right? Um, what will the yacht be used for? Where will she be used for? Um, if there's not clarity, what will the various scenarios mean? So if a yacht is being um, used commercially and there's an intention to charter her in Europe and outside of Europe, but the owner wants to use the yacht for a few months every year, does that have an impact on the VAT? On importation, does the owner need to pay back some of the VAT? I mean, these are questions that I get 
on a weekly basis. So I'm just, you know, highlighting this. Um, also, I think there is a bit of responsibility. Maybe that's going to be a bit contentious, but of, of course, there's getting the correct advice initially, but then I think there has to be a relationship with the advisory um, um, throughout the ownership of the yacht. And I say that because um, uh, owners need to advise and seek advice if they are planning any extraordinary work on the yacht refits, if they're planning to move the yacht for a significant amount of time outside of Europe. I think it's always good to touch base, right? Drop an email and, and say, listen, um, you know, I'm planning this with my captain and what do you think? And I think having a rapport with the family office, with the owner, with the client, of course, depending on the particular setting up is really important um, and it, it's just I mean tax has such a bad reputation it always has the worst reputation you know we're always the least popular panel we're always the, <laughs> as regards interest in the in the sense of you know um, the, how, how entertaining the content is but it's such an important one and uh, I think it, it, just getting your facts right from the beginning um, is a responsibility Right, so so it's a responsibility to seek correct advice, and nowadays I think it's it's very clear where you can obtain it. So uh, I think I think that the message is having a close um, dialogue, right, between between the the planned lifetime of the yacht, the planned intention, and also trying to get advice um, which is which is timely and which is correct. Yeah. Any other comments? No, just I, I, I fully agree with, with what Alison was saying. Sometimes we are bothered bored, bored, uh, when, when, when there is a, a very special transaction or when there is a, uh, they, they are facing a, a problem with the authorities, etc. And everything must be thought with time enough to have the proper uh, structure in place for the use of the owner, involve the owner, involve the family offices, um, uh, advising uh, the owner in each and every other matters, etc. This is, this is crucial uh, to not have to face uh, strong consequences in some, in some occasions uh, due to the lack of information or to the lack of a specialist uh, in advising these kind of transactions, clearly. Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic because obviously what, what's, what we see over the last few years is, is what I call interest that comes from, or sorry, inf information that comes from someone that may have self-interest or may have bias. What we need to try and do surely is, is create a, a situation where people are really thinking and asking all the right questions of a qualified advisor, because that's another point, Alison, you made, is how do you choose the right advisor? Because there are so many different quality of, of and different levels of people out there that you may have um, people giving bad advice, and that's been a problem we've had in the past. So we need to make sure that the, the captains, the managers, the family officers, the charter managers, and all the owners' network really understand where to start and when to start. And to me, that's where some of the mistakes are made. No, I mean, definitely how to find the right advice. I think the one advantage we have in this industry is that it's a, it's a small one, ironically. So uh, I, I believe it's such a close knit community um, and, uh, you know, working in it for, for, I mean, 14 years now, it's, you do build um, connections, you know, you build dialogue, you build referrals of, there are, a tremendous amount of reputable advisors. What type of advice should you seek? I mean, it's quite simple. If you're buying a yacht, I think you do need a lawyer. <laughs> so, so it's it's uh, again going down to basics, um, of course. And that's why I make a distinction between the chartering market and the and the sale and purchase market. So it's it's really understanding that you cannot cut corners. So just get the right advice from the very beginning. If it's a legal issue, if it's a structuring issue, go to a law firm, go to an advisory firm that has been referred to you, that you know works, um, and, and stick to it and, and uh, get all your ducks in a row from the beginning. You know, I think, 
I think that's it. It's uh, it's quite simple, really. But yes, it it can be complex because there are so many players. No, the, the point is, when you say it like that, it sounds so simple. So does that mean the market is 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 heading in the right direction now, and we, we're going to have a much healthier tax landscape, and everyone's going to be happy, or are we going to have a situation where we still have lots of things to sort out? I think we st I'll, I'll, I'll let the others speak as well, but I, of course, it's, it's, I'm sure there are going to be other challenges coming up all the time. Yeah. But uh, I think the current landscape, which we've all outlined together, um, we, we have all the right um, cards in our hands, you know, it's, in our, it's on our lap, really. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I mean, again, we're focusing on the VAT side, so I think the... There, there is clarity, which, which we have been criticized for a long time as not having as an industry. Um, I think that over the next month, as Freddie said, of course, there will be clarifications. There's been a delay because of COVID and applying the rules. There might be some more delays. Yeah. But uh, I think I, I, am, I, I am looking at a more secure, um, uh, cohesive regulatory environment. Um, so I don't think that owners need to be scared about the VAT or tax side. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's the same consideration as buying any other asset. So I think it's just a question of approaching it in the in the right way and with the right mindset. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Okay, we've got about two or three minutes to finish off. Sarah, what's your um, takeaway advice you would give to the market today? What what one headline take takeaway? My advice for the market is to keep calm, hold on. <laughs> uh, no, and I would like to transfer a simple message to the market. Um, despite the many changes occurred during the past year in Italy, uh, referring to the uh, approach of the VAT loan, the charter market, I'm I'm sure that with harmonization, we'll uh, make uh, procedures and la uh, applied on the charter contracts much, much easier. So despite COVID, despite many changes, uh, uh, cancellation, clarification uh, issued by the authorities in the past months, uh, what I want to to say to the market is to be confident uh, that uh, we are going in the right direction to uh, make our lives much easier. And not only ours, uh, but also the one for the captains and owners. Yeah, yeah. Everything uh, will be much, much more clear. And so uh, much easier also for brokers and all operators of the um, charter market to explain also to clients. Uh, so we don't have to see a nightmare at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> but Good that's the plan. Jennifer, what, what's your takeaway? Okay, I agree completely with Alison. Make sure you get the right advice before you come or wherever, before you cruise charter. If you want to charter in Greece, uh, with a charter license this uh, summer, start early applying for it because the authorities are under, I mean, they're overworked with all the COVID uh, problems. If you're a private boat coming to Greece, make sure, a crucial point I always tell clients, make sure you're not advertised as a commercial boat on the internet. Maybe you were a charter boat in the past. Yep. Um, charter fleet is usually the website where uh, you still have your boat up there and you get fined by the Greek authorities. Um, and also, if you don't want to get a charter license and you're considering starting or ending and ending outside of Greece, make sure the borders are open with the neighboring countries. So those are my main takeaway points. Perfect. Thank you. Freddie, your takeaways? Oh, very, very simple. Uh, identify your project and be prepared and work closely with your, your advisor. I think it is very important to know precisely what we want to do with the with the yacht, or if it is another intention, refit or sell and purchase, uh, you have to, to know what you want to do, where, when, general question as usual, but please prepare your project in advance. Yep. Don't wait the last time to do that, because if you do that, you run a risk. It is life as usual. Absolutely. Alison? 
I'm sorry, I muted myself. Um, I, again, yes, I'm, I, I, don't, I, I mean, I think I've said what, what I wanted to say, you know, it's, it's just being prepared and, uh, and not being, uh, you know, not trying to dig your head in the sand and, and avoid things and then they just come to bite you later. So a clear plan. And Miguel, final, final comment from the Bally Eriks. Yes, uh, well, I, I, I agree with what my peers have said before. It is absolutely relevant to take the right advice. Tax and legal uh, customs, etc., will never be the easiest. It's generally complex. But I feel that the countries, with all the money they have spent in the pandemic, are more open to clarify positions and to make things easier. This is a very important point. And I think that I also have some duties for the tax authorities, especially in Europe. They have been harmonizing uh, now with the VAT on the charter fees, etc. But there is a lot to do. Europe is not the United States. It is still uh, very young. So there is much to do, for example, with regulations. Regulations, as the customs code is, are not uh, under interpretation are compulsory for each and every of the citizens of the union, not the states. So there should be no room for much interpretation. And it is a bit shaming to see how the customs regime as temporary admission, returns good relief, uh, inward process relief are understood in a different way in the different EU countries this is a duty for the European Commission that have to take care of it because this cannot be like that. Perfect. Miguel, thank you very much indeed. Panel, you've been amazing. Uh, very good advice and very good insights. Uh, very simple message. Plan, plan, and ask every question you can think of that's relevant to your yacht. Uh, panel, see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.